Well, thank you very much, Melina and Alan. It's a, a, a great uh, joy and privilege to be here and be able to share some thoughts with you. My task is to try to uh, talk about procedural-based simulation. We're hearing about skills-focused simulation and ways to engage the learner. What about procedural-based simulation? So I'll just give you a little bit of background. What is out there? Uh, uh, present the very paltry data that's uh, there and then talk a little bit about the unique challenges when we're trying to put it together in surgical procedures and maybe a suggestion about the way the way forward. Um, uh, this is a, a, an assembly of folks who are interested in, in surgical education and uh, simulation-based training. And so it's a little bit of preaching to the choir when we recognize, we all recognize that the, the days of see one, do one, uh, teach one are long gone. The, the rapid emergence of techniques and technology demands uh, a, a new way uh, to train uh, surgeons, not just now, but forever going forward. Um, we are late to the game of simulation-based learning and simulation-based training. Uh, uh, Dave Gaba, one of the real fathers of uh, simulation, simulation-based training, said uh, several years ago that no industry in which human lives depend on the skilled performance of responsible operators has waited as long as we have in healthcare for the unequivocal evidence of benefit. And, and so we shouldn't be waiting for that to be our standard. Uh, we know well of our colleagues in the aviation and military and, and, and space uh, uh, professions, how, how effectively they've brought this in. We'll talk a little bit more about that uh, towards the end. Um, uh, again, this is an audience that's sophisticated and focused on, on, on simulation. And so you know that the issues that we have to be, be um, attending to when we're talking about this are uh, things like fidelity, validation evidence, reliability, cost, transfer of training. If there's no transfer of training at the end of the exercise into a clinical real world uh, uh, scenario, then um, a lot of this is, is a vain exercise. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about fidelity because this comes into play uh, when we talk about procedural simulation more than any of these other things. And, and one of the points that we'll come back to as we cycle back is that the evidence is that the level of fidelity or sophisticated sophistication in simulation and modeling has to be matched to the level of fidelity of the, the learner. Um, or, or the person for whom the exercise is, is designed. So we can teach medical students how to tie knots on the handle of a mug, but if you're going to teach uh, anybody here on the panel uh, how to do um, a, a real procedure, uh, then there has to be a level of sophistication and, and uh, very high fidelity to make this a, an effective learning exercise. So this is the point we're going to cycle back to towards the end. This is where the bar is set for us. We know very quickly if this is a useful uh, uh, exercise or a waste of, of our time. Um, uh, back about 10 years ago when I was at University of Kentucky, we did some work um, mostly because the cost uh, issue was so prohibitive and we were trying to get the residents through on a large scale of uh, pr laparoscopic procedures. We just couldn't afford to keep doing this. So we developed our own little cookbook and we looked at various things, what the validity uh, evidence was on uh, particularly construct validity. And so uh, an inguinal hernia we developed and if there's time after, you can talk about some of the things we learned about being creative and, and, and cost conscious. Um, uh, cholecystectomy, appendectomy, and, and again, I can tell you that when we looked at the, and I know this is now discredited and, and this isn't what we should be talking about in simulation, but in terms of if the learners thought, hey, this wasn't a bad, uh, bad representation of, of the real thing, it scored reasonably well. When we looked at construct validities in terms of how the various learners separated in either task speed or skills rating, our, our, uh, our little models uh, performed fairly well. And the, 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 the data is replete with such reports. But, but, but really, what can we say from a study such as ours and the myriad of others that are similar to it? Well, like most, um, we didn't demonstrate that there was transfer training from these models to the real world scenario. That, that is the goal, the goal test. That's really what we want to be working towards. It doesn't mean that there, that there wasn't uh, um, going to be transfer of training, but we certainly didn't demonstrate that. Um, and so I think what we can show is that the, some of these studies show that it's better spending time training residents than not training residents, um, and um, that there may be some, some skills acquisition along the way, and, and you need to do so in a way that the level of uh, trainee separates, uh, obviously, uh, through, through the exercise you're putting them through. But none of these have we really said meaningfully, with a, a very few exceptions, that there's been transfer training. 
Um, this is a, a study. So to, to now take you through, that's a very brief background, to take you through now some examples of procedural-based training such, such as exist. This is a, this is a study that uh, actually Molina was very involved in. This is a, a simulated uh, abdominal wall that we developed here at the University of Maryland. And it was to, uh, to simulate uh, uh, laparoscopic incisional hernia repair. This is a study that Molina oversaw uh, of 14 surgeons, two different departments of surgery. This is what the saw model looks like. We've used this extent. We've replaced uh, all porcine um, courses now for incisional hernia repair with the saw model. And, and we used the goals incisional hernia um, scoring uh, um, instrument. This was developed at McGill, and, and as you know, this is the global operative assessment of laparoscopic skills, and we looked at seven, seven domains, and, and I won't go through these now, but, but what we did in this study was we showed, and this was, again, this is a procedural study. This was not an isolated skills, learning how to suture or uh, transfer type thing, but this was an entire procedure, that there was excellent um, correlation uh, between uh, laparoscopic incisional hernia repair performance in the simulator and in the clinical uh, scenario. That's how the study was uh, structured. Um, and we, we were able to suggest from this study that that performance in the simulator model uh, should predict performance in the operating room. And furthermore, uh, we may be able to use uh, performance measures uh, in the SAW model uh, to establish um, uh, standards uh, uh, for performance elsewhere based on uh, expert performance in that model. So there's one example. Again, the Kentucky examples, uh, we didn't show transfer of training. Here's one where we may have. But the, the, the evidence is very paltry. Here's an example um, of in the vascular uh, surgery world, endoluminal therapy. And again, you would think that um, in endoluminal uh, therapy, whether it's uh, endovascular or, or GI, that the, um, the modeling requirements are a little bit more finite than, than we'll talk about in a sec that would be making further advances than we've made to this point. So this is a study, um, Gallagher et al., and it basically is just simply looking at what the, uh, the users think of this new simulator. There's not yet been the evidence that, that uh, um, this is embolizing a, uh, um, a uterine fibroid that's bleeding in a simulated manner. There's not evidence yet that this transfers, but, but again, here's starting to put procedural simulators together, and in the endoluminal realm, I think there's a much greater opportunity for earlier success than in, the, in, in some of the other broader abdominal ones we'll talk about in a sec. This is some work that's gone, been going on in uh, Halifax under the leadership of Dave Clark, the head of neur neur neurosurgery at, at Dalhousie. I think this is wonderful work, very clever work, and they've brought all sorts of national agencies together. And what they have uh, now done is this is a real patient data. This is patient who's to undergo resection of a, of a cranial lesion. And this is modeled, and this is modeled to a high level of fidelity and the simulator actually allows the residents and the fellows to rehearse this operation uh, on, on this patient's anatomy. And um, the instruments are, again, a little crude, and, the, and the, uh, the interfaces are continually improving. But here's an opportunity, procedurally based, to, um, to do an entire procedure, to rehearse a procedure. And this was a couple of years ago, and this is the, the first patient to go through this, where this patient's uh, tumor resection was completely rehearsed uh, prior to the undertaking of the operation. Now, uh, this is, uh, again, we have a short amount of time to try to impart a bunch of information. So uh, a galloping overview of the very limited options that are out there in terms of, and there are, there are obviously more um, singular examples that are out there in terms of procedural-based simulation. But when we pause to look at the state of the evidence that out there, Rutherford uh, published a paper in Annals about six years ago, and the Toronto group, um, uh, Hamster and Zendejas and Cook, just uh, published a piece in Annals this month and uh, really followed up on the work of Sutherland. Uh, literature search through 2011, almost 11,000 articles pulled, and trying to get a sense of what's the evidence, focusing on, sim on laparoscopic surgery, what's the evidence of the benefit of simulation-based training for laparoscopic surgery? And they were able to make a few conclusions. Um, so that's a block trainer or the box trainer or the mechanical trainer uh, uniformly uh, outperforms the virtual uh, trainer in most studies. There are a few studies that are an exception in that regard, but this is increasingly the trend that we're seeing that the mechanical trainers are outperforming the, the virtual reality trainers. Um, and the cadavers are, are, are still in, in play, uh, and they measured all sorts of things like haptics and feedback, what's the best way to do that based on these studies. But the conclusion uh, was so similar to the conclusion from Rutherford's paper, simulation 
evidence-based lab training of professionals has benefits when compared to no intervention. Well, that's wonderful. Um, uh, but it's moderately more effective than non-simulation uh, instruction. So we're not exactly hitting it out of the park at this point, this many years into trying to figure out how to harness simulation-based training into uh, not just the education of our surgical trainees, but also um, uh, surgeons in practice, and, and we'll talk about that in just a sec. So uh, one of the, the points that I make uh, when I talk about this is that, is that we have some unique challenges here. And I would submit to you that, uh, again, back to the issue of fidelity uh, and the level of fidelity matching the, the model to the level of, of sophistication of the learner, the most sophisticated uh, instrument that we can design as humans, uh, take the space shuttle, we can model to a level of complete fidelity so that when somebody wants to learn how to, how to fly that, they can, they can do that with, with utter and complete um, uh, replication of the real world, world scenario will be. The most sophisticated thing, and I would suggest to you that the challenges of modeling the functions, all the functions of the space shuttle pale in comparison to doing the same with the same level of fidelity for an organ, any organ, take the pancreas. And this is what we're up against. If we want to, if we want to model uh, an organ uh, from a from a microstructural, macrostructural, functional uh, level, um, we're just we're miles and miles away from doing that. It, it, it's a monstrously difficult problem. Uh, I, I do like to point out that the um, uh, neurosurgeons and the orthopods have a lot easier go of it. You know, their their little organs are just stuck in one place. The fiducials are easy to uh, uh, to work around and stuff. And as abdominal surgeons, we have a much greater and the other issue is there's no really, there has no, been no evidence of a cost or a business case uh, for doing this, for getting the virtual simulation up to that level of sophistication that we really need. In the, in the gaming world, we've just heard this from Chris, um, how, how things are advancing, and, um, and, and we're still stuck at fairly, fairly uh, uh, rudimentary um, uh, imagery and, and, and ability to interact with that, with that imagery. And there, there just has not been the business case to support this. Um, uh, Rick uh, Stava here and I've uh, been involved with other, other folks trying to, to get the kind of funding we need to do uh, to move this forward and it, and it, and it just hasn't. So um, as I just wrap up here, the way forward, this is, this is really, you know, as all these presentations, a lot in a short period of time, uh, solving the, the business case for the funding of the kind of simulators that we need is, is a continuing challenge whether they're VR or they're hybrid or, or, or some kind of uh, combination thereof. Um, I haven't really talked about this, but can we focus more on cognitive task analysis to fill a gap instead of having, instead of trying to create uh, maybe the, the, the imagery and the modeling and the, and, and the, um, and the haptics, is it, can, can we be more focused in, in how we go about this? Um, we are going to be seeing much more simulation, and this may drive it. This may, this may be one of the drivers to the, to the funding for procedural rehearsal, for assessment and, and, and remediation of skill degradation in surgeons. It's going to be in the interest of every country represented here that, that surgeons stay in practice as long as they can. So how are we going to measure uh, that the skills are maintained appropriately? And this may be a role uh, the, 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 for simulation to play. Um, and, and, and one of the things that we don't talk about, I, I, I say quite frequently to my, uh, to my fellows and others, that I think that mastery in surgery is probably 80 to 85 percent cognitive and maybe 15 percent technical. And we don't spend any time uh, modeling cognitive simulators, decision making, judgment uh, training, and things like that. So these are other things we need to be thinking about. Uh, but the bottom line is, can we afford to wait until it's perfect? And, and I, I think the answer is no. And I thank you for your attention. <laughs>